What's up chemistry people? Uh, today, what in the heck are we gonna learn in this video? We are gonna calculate empirical and molecular formulas. All right, so some new vocabulary here. First of all, we're gonna find what the heck an empirical formula is. Then we're gonna find what the heck is a molecular formula. And then once we know what those things are, we're gonna calculate both empirical formulas for a compound and molecular formulas for a compound. So let's get started. Uh, first things first, what is an empirical formula? Uh, an empirical formula simply consists of the symbols for the elements combined in a compound with the subscript showing the smallest whole number mole ratio of the different elements in that compound. Now, when we're talking about ionic compounds, uh, typically the formula unit is the empirical formula. Just based on how we write ionic compounds, uh, it will already be the smallest ratio. So as you think about an ionic compound like magnesium chloride, uh, based on how we write the formula for magnesium chloride, it's already going to be in the smallest ratio, in this case, a ratio of one to two. Even in those examples uh, like calcium sulfate, where if you do the crisscross method, uh, you still end up having to reduce to write the formula unit. So generally speaking, for ionic compounds, the formula unit that you write for the compound itself is its empirical formula. Now for uh, covalent or molecular compounds, uh, the molecule may or may not always represent the compound's empirical formula or the smallest ratio. So you've got to watch out for those covalent compounds when it comes to empirical formulas. Think about carbon dioxide. Um, CO2 is a classic example of a covalent compound, two nonmetals, um, which does have its empirical formula represented, a ratio of one to two. However, if you think about dinitrogen tetroxide, N2O4, uh, this is an example of a covalent compound where the subscripts in the formula don't relate to the lowest or the smallest whole number ratio of the elements in the compound. Um, the ratio, the smallest ratio, would be one to two, but it would no longer be dinitrogen tetroxide uh, if we reduced it there. Which brings us to the idea then of molecular formulas. Empirical formulas are going to show us the smallest whole number ratio of elements in a compound. It's the molecular formula that shows us the actual formula of a compound. Now, for ionic compounds, uh, typically the empirical and molecular formulas are the same. Again, just by the nature of how we write ionic compounds, those two things, empirical and molecular, will be the same. So if you think about magnesium chloride, again, the actual formula, the molecular formula for magnesium chloride is MgCl2. It also is the smallest ratio. Again, think about calcium sulfate. The actual or molecular formula for this compound is CaSO4, or the ratio is 1 to 1. Um, so again, we're really only going to be thinking about molecular formulas for the most part when we talk about covalent compounds. Uh, so your covalent or molecular compounds is where we really run into um, the question of, well, is this empirical or is this molecular? Uh, because in covalent compounds, it may or may not be the same. So again, let's go back and take a quick look at carbon dioxide. Here's an example of a covalent compound where empirical and molecular formulas are the same, identical. Um, the smallest ratio is one to two. The true or actual formula of carbon dioxide shows a ratio of one to two. Dinitrogen tetroxide is where things get a little interesting. Uh, again, the molecular or actual formula for dinitrogen tetroxide is N2O4, which shows a ratio of two nitrogen to four oxygen. However, the empirical formula for this compound would be one nitrogen to two oxygen. So important, keep in mind that it's the covalent compounds. We've really got to watch out for uh, and make a distinction between the, between the empirical and molecular uh, formulas. So what is the relationship between uh, the compound's empirical or molecular formula? We can write it as, uh, as follows here on your screen, where whatever your empirical formula is, we just have to multiply it by some number x um, to get our molecular formula. And that number x is going to be a whole number multiple um, in which we multiply the empirical formula by to get its actual or true molecular formula. So going back to this example of dinitrogen tetroxide N2O4, the empirical formula for this compound showing the smallest whole number ratio would be NO2. However, the true formula for this compound is N2O4. 
So how do we go from empirical to molecular? Well, we just take the empirical formula of NO2, multiply it by the whole number factor of two to get N2O4. All right, so last we're gonna talk some quick tips for solving calculations involving empirical formulas and molecular formulas. Uh, some of these things will make a lot more sense when we start working through some problems, but first, keep in mind that when you're given percent composition of a compound and you're asked to determine empirical molecular formula, always assume it 100 grams of the compound. Uh, it makes determination of the mass value of each element easier. And the reason why it makes this easier is it makes converting to percent from percentages two grams a heck of a lot easier. For example, 50% uh, of 100 grams is 50 grams, or 25% of 100 grams is 25 grams, or let's get tricky, 22.16% of 100 grams is still 22.16 grams. So assume 100 grams, it makes your life easier. Tip number two, uh, remember that the subscripts represent the ratio of moles of each element in a formula. Therefore, if you're given masses or percentages, just realize you've got to get to moles. Moles is key. Tip number three, if the mole ratio is not an exact whole number, but close, so usually we're talking less than a tenth of a mole, just round to the nearest whole number, it's close enough. So tip number four, uh, keep in mind then if you uh, are determining number of moles and it's not close to a whole number, you have to multiply each amount um, by a factor that will get you to a whole number ratio. And we'll practice this in a couple of problems, but for you mathematical geniuses out there, basically when you look at your number of moles and it's not a whole number, you can look at the decimal and use the fractional form of that decimal to determine what you have to multiply uh, that ratio by to get a whole number ratio. Uh, we'll take a look at this. Um, if you're really confused by this last tip, it will make a lot of sense when we work through a couple of examples, but again, I encourage you to recognize the relationship between the decimal and their fractional form. As always, a quick reference to the images used in this presentation. 